uh, social posts. Oh. All right. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us here today for uh, Luna's latest installment and live webinar series. This is uh, post processing uh, master class at a postgraduate level. And uh, my name is Joe Goodman. I'm the sales engineering director here at Luna Technologies. Uh, joining us today is co founder. Uh, Kyler Buck of both Bobsled Extracts and Luna Technologies, uh, as well as our special guest, Mary Babbitts, founder of Cascade Sciences. Adam Hain uh, with Technical Sales will be joining us as well. So uh, we'll post links in the uh, social media um, chat uh, area here to uh, be able to follow us um, on all the various platforms. And a recording will be made available uh, to everyone here today for future reference as well. So. Uh, today's webinar is going to be a behind the scenes look at post processing with the IO extractor. Uh, you'll see Mary talk uh, about the few of the, a few of the benefits uh, with Cascade back ovens, uh, including a cold trap. Uh, you'll see Kyler dial in uh, the process to getting to finished products um, with a set of vacuum ovens, um, you know, and a cold track uh, trap. And then later on, uh, we'll kind of have a brief overview running down. We'll make sure we're covering today uh, cured and live resin vape cards, as well as diamonds, sauce, sugar, and shatter, and kind of go through all of those in detail. So uh, thanks for joining us here. I'm gonna send it over to uh, Kyler and Mary in the lab. Thanks, Joe. My name's Kyler Buck with Bobsled Extracts. I want to apologize in advance about the audio quality. We're in a active lab right now, so we got a little bit of background noise going on. But I am very excited to have Mary here with Cascade. Uh, Mary, would you mind telling us what Cascade is and uh, what you're all about? Sure. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Mary. I'm the founder of Cascade Sciences. And when Luna told me they were doing a post-processing webinar, I was so honored to be able to participate. Uh, Cascade Sciences, as you know, we're famous for our blue vacuum ovens. Um, as well as a lot of post-processing or refining tools, everything from freeze-drying, uh, rotary evaporation, distillation, all of that. So I like to think of Luna as someone who's step one, the extraction, and then Cascade follows up with step two in kind of the further refining of, of the extract. So thank you again for, for having me, Kyla. Yeah, thank you. And we have your... Uh TV 10 model here, you have a couple different sizes, a um, couple different price points yes. and entry points to get in. So I love this model, but uh, it's not the only model you guys have available. Sure. I mean, you've definitely gone big. This is our largest vacuum oven, 10 cubic feet. I mean, the surface area on these shelves alone is huge. Do you have any idea about the, the size of the slabs that you're able to fit on a shelf? Well, what's awesome about these ovens is we're, you know, we use parchment paper. And what I love about these ovens, we're able to get two large, uh, you know, slabs side by side. Oh, so, right. you know, typically our slabs are from 100 to 300 gram pour out. Right. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've found these ovens with the how many shelves we can get in. Per square inch, we can fit more oil in these ovens than any of the other ovens I've used. Fantastic. So, and then what about the temperature performance? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's dead on, and that's what I love about Cascade. You guys, I mean, obviously come from an even more exact science. Uh, you know, I know you guys have been around before uh, the cannabis industry kind of came about. So, yeah, uh, really cannabis really called to us because if you think about it, when you're doing these extracts, there is so much time and money and blood, sweat and tears that have gone into making this extract. Yeah. And so vacuum ovens are notorious for having uh, poor temperature stability. And so cannabis really said, hey, we need a better solution for a temperature stable vacuum oven. And that's where Cascade came in. I mean, and really, the, the big difference with Cascade vacuum ovens is we actually have the probe inside the oven. So 
when you're putting something temperature sensitive inside a vacuum oven, which has a reputation for being not so great at controlling temperature, Cascade went ahead and put a probe inside the oven to make sure that we, we can protect the product and offer that stability. So this looks like some really great products that you've been able to make yeah. in our oven. So can you tell me about these? Yeah. Well, one real quick thing I'd like to touch on that is, again, Cascade's American-made. Oh. And so is Lunatech, yes. so we support that. And then on temperature, the importance is, as you'll see, is terpenes. Like why temperature control is so important is because terpenes are so important. And one of the most, they're more valuable compound than the THC itself. Um, so getting into that, you can see we have a couple different products on the shelf here, Joe, um, from Shatter, we have some sugar, we have some diamonds, we have some sauce on top of sugar. Uh, I wanted to make sure we had the jars available for you guys to see uh, the crash out happening and the temp, the terpenes separating. So I think we can start with the shatter. This was made in the Cascade. Um, it was poured directly on parchment paper out of our extractor and then put in the oven. Um, we typically do a from 85 to 105 degrees as we pull a vacuum. Kind of depends on the stability of the oil. If it's super stable, uh, you want to have a little bit higher temperature so that the muffin can actually drop. Um, and then... What about the different strains? Do different strains behave differently as far as how they would into a slab of shatter? You know, it's less about the strains and really I think more about the terpene content. Okay. Uh, because that affects the stability. The okay. less terpenes in it, the more stable uh, the THCA is going to be. Because terpenes, if you think about it, it's really, they're a solvent. And they yes. are what, uh, you know, might... Uh, is the difference from like a tacky slab to a stable slab, that tacky slab is going to probably have a much higher terpene content. So you're saying about 80 to about 120, is that what I... Yeah, it, we try and not go over 105. 105? Uh-huh. You can definitely, uh, there's a lot of people I know that are wanting to do quicker purge times. Um, okay. So yeah, you can go higher in temperature. What, what is your purge time generally? On this shatter, we typically are about 48 hours and we have four flips um, in those 48 hours. Um, and do you keep the vacuum valve open the entire time? We do keep the vacuum valve okay. open the entire time. And with that, uh, we make sure we also have the cold traps that we got from you too. Right. Um, right. Those are very important for capturing any of the terpenes that might have been off-gassed. So you are capturing terpenes in the trap? Per, oh, a lot of terpenes in the what trap. Do you do, what do you do with the terpenes that you've captured in the trap? Um, what's great about cold trap terpenes is they're 100% pure terpenes and they have no cannabinoids in them. So, I mean, you can sell them across state lines. Uh, we can put them back into our own products and, you know, enhance the flavor, use them to juice up a vape cart, or we can sell those terpenes to other companies that, you know, are mixing those terpenes back in with distillate. Do they have any residual solvent left in them? The terpenes do not have residual solvent left in them. Nice. We nice. do... You do some kind have some moisture, so you want to use a separatory funnel and right. uh, okay. separate the water from the terpenes, which is really easy because they, they want to separate. I've heard of a, a pro tip when people are harvesting terpenes in our traps. Um, you'll see we have this stainless steel vessel, and that's where the terpenes are going to collect. What I've seen some customers do that are in a high throughput environment, much like yours, they have a spare trap on hand, so they hop out the, the trap that is frozen or full okay. of terpenes, set it aside so that can be harvested, drop in a fresh, ready to go so that they can keep on purging, and the whole process doesn't stop just because you want to grab the terpenes out of the trap. 
Well, that makes a lot of sense and looks like we'll be talking about getting some extra traps in there. So yeah, so we have shatter. This was made by flipping. Um, you know, we wanted to make sure at, you know, probably every 12 hours we pull out and flip. So that okay. gives us the full flip. And then these are coming back, you know, at under 100 parts per million residual solvents. Uh, we And you can get them down to zero. Um, next on the plate, we have diamonds. Now, diamonds is just the industry word for isolate uh, because that it's the same as isolate. These are going to be a 99.9% you know, purity. This has been made from a crash out, which is we put, instead of just pouring it on parchment and uh, purging in the oven, we actually put it in a pressurized vessel and allowed the THCA to drop out of solution. The diamonds, um, once you put them in like a jar, you can see here, this was poured right out of the extractor into the jar. And that's something our Lunatech uh, machine is able to do and is the only system on the market that can do it is it actually lets you choose how much solvent is left when you pour every time so that we can consistently grow the same size diamonds and have similar crash outs and wow. uh, consistent times. Okay, that's huge because yeah. this, one of the things that I hear often is about variability in batches and processes yeah. so that can't really consistently push out the same product. So yeah. with Our, the Luna Extractor being able to do that consistently is just a huge boost for productivity yeah. and profitability. That's, Our, that's our system, which is 100% automated, actually uses an algorithm based on the boiling uh, points of your solvent blend. So there's a section, you choose, whether you're running pure propane, pure oh, okay. butane, okay. or any sort of blend, you choose what blend you're using, it now knows the boiling points and is able to use an algorithm based off of pressure and temperature to know how much solvent is left when you pour, which is crucial that to is. crashing out. That um, is. Because and you the repeatability. Just gosh, that's that's just huge. That's yeah. Huge. So yeah, you can see this, you know, the they're almost clear, the separation is good. Um, you can see here in the jar, you know, this is the THCA falling out of solution. What we've done is left a little bit of solvent in here uh, that allows, you know, under pressure and time that THC naturally wants to fall out of solution, collects on the bottom. I would then open the jar and strain off and pour off the terpenes, uh, which would give me this separated uh, diamond or isolate fraction. Um, then I would put both products back in the oven and purge them to get the you know zero residual the solvents final, down. Get that final excellent. excellent. So that's a, what about a, the temperature range for diamonds? Is it different than? Yeah, uh, I actually always make sure I do diamonds closer to the eighty-five well, because I have my sauce separation in the same oven at the same time. Uh, and then your sauce is that really high uh, terpene, HTE, high terpene extract product. Right. Okay. Um, so just like the purity of the THC has raised on the diamonds, um, the terpenes have gone way up on the sauce. So if I started, if this was a live resin product, it might naturally have come out with 15% terpenes and, you know, 70% THC. I've now out of that product created a product with 99% THC and that leaves me with the sauce or they call it mother liquor uh, with now closer to like a 40, 45% terpene uh, percentage in the, in the sauce. How do you decide what, um what, what your product mix is going to be. So do you say, oh, uh, is it based truly on just on market-driven factors like shatter is very hot right now or everybody wants diamonds? How do you 
How do you craft that mix? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, supply and demand. Okay. Um, we, at Bobsled as a product, we make all, you know, a wide variety of products that we sell to dispensaries. So it's kind of in demand, what's in demand, what's at the time, but then also your biomass. You know, if I'm using dry material, I'm probably going to want to make more of a shatter product. If I'm okay. using live resin, I know that I'm going to want like a saucy or, you know, sugar product because sense. it's not going to be stable. The terpenes in live resin won't allow the stability that is in like shatter. Makes sense. Makes um, sense. All right, what do we have here? So here is a couple different uh, batches of sugar. Um, you can see, Joe, if you come up closely, you can actually see the terpene layer on top and the sugar underneath. This is a mut, it's crashing out just like the diamonds did, but not, it wasn't pressurized, so it's not as clean of a separation, which is okay. This is still an incredibly desired product because it has all the flavor, all the cannabinoids mixed into one, you know, meant to be consumed together. What's nice about the sauce and diamonds is you can separate it and create different products. And then if you wanted to combine them back to make, you know, a regular product again, but you could actually see the terpene layer on top. The, Look at that. Wow. And this is all, you know, you can see under these terpenes, you have that crystalline, you know, yes. almost diamond formation happening. So you can achieve it outside of a jar or outside of a diamond miner. It's just not going to be quite as clean as a separation. And um, with the different color variation, again, is this just, is this a function of any time or temperature or is it? Um, no, the, this the, is the material, biomass. the biomass and okay. material driven. Um, obviously, usually with the higher quality product, you're going to have a lighter color material. Okay. But, you know, also you see terpenes a lot of times oxidize too. So that's why the sauce uh, is usually a little bit darker than the THCA. One thing to note on this is you see how this is, you know, a two inch thick layer in the Pyrex and this is, you know, a quarter inch. Right. That is a difference when you're in the oven, uh, you know, how long you're going to want to purge for. So if you have, if yes. you pour a large amount into a Pyrex, you're now going to have to purge for a longer amount of time. Yes, that so is true. So we, you know, on something that with this type of thickness, we can go up to, you know, 75 to even 100 hours in the oven to get the residual well, yes. solvent levels we well, want. Definitely longer purge times, the thicker the pores. This is a universal uh, question with, that I get all the time about vacuum ovens. Is how long is my purge going to take? Well, the answer is it depends. It depends on what product you're making. It depends on the thickness. It depends on whether you flip. Um, also, the temperature transfer. So these are very thermally, these Pyrex dishes are really thermally conductive, which is great, but the temperature from the shelf still has to find its way into that yeah. dish, and the thickness of your material also increases the time for those, those solvent molecules to find their way out, so nice. Yeah, and then again, so just like uh, the sauce can be separated in the diamonds, like I would want to strain this sauce off and separate it and then i can go back and create you know vape cartridges i can add it back into sugar create dabbables um, so there's a lot of play and a lot of different products you can create um, you see we have sugar we don't have an example of batter here right now but if i wanted to uh, make a batter i would use this similar type of pyrex i would pour it into the pyrex and during my purging process i would actually whip it up uh in the pyrex to create the agitation and then that batter or you know crumble consistency um but what, what is the market uh what is the market desirability for batter 
You know, it used to be higher uh, than it was. I think now sugar has predominantly okay. taken over and the marketplace. It, what's the consumer preference? Is, does batter have a different uh, consistency? A well, different yeah, it's, it's, um, it does have a different consistency. It's a little bit drier to the touch. Okay. Um, so I don't know if you're loading your rig, you might be able to use your fingers and get okay. it in to where you definitely want to tool with something with this consistency um, to well, load it off. What I see here is that, it, and it's just important in any operation, is to have a variety of different products. All of them are going to require some sort of post-processing, tweaking the, the time, temperature, vacuum levels and such, but the more products that you can make, the, the better you can serve the market, and it's just a really good business practice, too. Yeah, so smart and, idea. and then that is something if you walk into dispensaries today and you look at their extract shelf, it's going to be predominantly BHO products. Like the, I would say BHO products make up 80% of, you know, the extracts on a dispensary shelf. Um, so you want to make sure you have the equipment to supply that demand. Um, one thing I wanted to bring up here is vape cartridges and a new fad is uh, live resin vape cartridges are really starting to take over the shelf space on dispensaries and then you could actually have cured resin vape carts as well. Now the difference between this product and distillate which is traditionally used for the vape carts is this product has all of the terpenes still intact and now the difference between again besides the terpenes this is thca distillate is delta 9 it's already been activated which gives it that consistency that's able to go into the vape cart what we have now found out if we partially decarb uh this thca it will be able to get that distillate consistency and load directly into a vape pen. But you have 100% uh, cannabis derived flavor, strain specific, and as consumers are getting educated, they're wanting a live resin or a cured resin vape cart uh, over distillate because of the terpenes, because of the flavor, and yeah. especially, you know, what we're able to do with this product is pour off the sauce create you know our dabbables from it and then we can pour the sauce into our vape cartridge mixture and have an incredible flavor profile high quality uh bho vape cartridge that really needed a lot less post-processing than you know the traditional distillate vape cart it's really too bad that this webinar is not in smell -a -vision. Because all of these terpenes and live resin and products that Kyler's talking about right now, I am experiencing, and it's it's quite lovely. So sorry, this is not in smell vision. <laughs> cured, well, uh, yeah, and then the difference between cured resin and live resin is the biomass. It's live resin comes from fresh frozen material. And the reason why you would want to use fresh frozen material is because of the terpenes. So just as Mary brought up, she is smelling, you know, the flavor in the air. Those are the terpenes evaporating off of the product. Just like if you've ever been in a drying room or around drying material, the whole block reeks. And that's you losing money. Yes. Those are terpenes evaporating off of the plant. So by processing fresh frozen, you're actually able to capture 30 to 50% more terpenes because you capture them before they evaporate off of the plant, which really goes back into why we also have the cold trap. It's the same, it is the exact same concept. Uh, we wanna make sure we're capturing all of those volatile terpenes that are potentially off-gassing. Yes, and um, then later in the in the webinar, I'll be able to show you some tips about using a vacuum to capture terpenes. Uh, the trap, of course, we can go over some of that as well. So you are right, Kyler. Terpenes are an extremely valuable portion of your product. 
that if you don't play your cards right, you can lose quite a bit of money. Yep, yeah, and uh, we'll actually show you. So I would take this. So on that process, we have set up here um, some pressurized vessels that I'll actually decarb this product in to get that distillate consistency I want. So I have these set up that I could be strain specific. I would just scoop this into uh, the top of this vessel. These vessels are all jacketed and heated where they can be controlled to uh, actually melt down this product into a vape car. Not needed, but. Yeah, um, now that's a really uh, consistent and nice way to do it. Technically, I could scoop it into a jar, put it in a vacuum oven, set it to 180 degrees for 24 hours and get the same uh, product that is literally ready to fill into a vape car. Now, when you put your jar inside the vacuum oven, are you pulling a vacuum or are you just using the temperature? Because I'm just using the temperature because it's pressurized, right. so there would be no need to pull the vacuum. It's an important point, okay? When Even though you're putting this jar that's creating positive pressure into a vacuum vessel, don't pull the vacuum. <laughs> Let's let the pressurized jar yeah. Well, Mary, thank you so much. It seems like you've brought some PTFE paper. Would you mind explaining me the advantages over parchment? Absolutely. So, Kyler, you were talking about the importance of terpenes, the value of terpenes, and things like that. So, when we deal with post-processing, we deal with vacuum, we're dealing with molecules, we're dealing with little things that make a big difference. So, the the PTFE paper, uh, as an alternative to parchment, is a little thing that can make a big difference. And I'll just review kind of the, the uh, pros and cons of each here. Parchment paper is paper with a silicon coating on it. And it works great. It has a ton of uses in cannabis, in food. It's wonderful. But as you mentioned, Kyler, terpenes are a solvent. And if you're a particularly terpene-rich product, that, those terpenes actually end up breaking down the silicon barrier and leaching into the paper. So there is some degree of terpene loss. And I, I've seen that happen before, especially on like a fresh frozen or yeah. like a live resin product with that higher terpene ratio. That's one of the reasons why we pour on the Pyrexes yes. over parchment over, because over parchment. I, I've seen that leach through kind of gets like a wet spot on the parchment. Yes, so that what that means is those, those beautiful terpenes are breaking down that silicon barrier. The other thing that's happening on a, on a molecular level is that the silicon coating molecules are also going into your product. So if you want to avoid that altogether, we have these pre-cut PTFE sheets or the vacuum oven shelves. Um, now you mentioned you're running the big tens, so a couple of these would fit on each shelf. And the PTFE coating is solvent resistant, it will not break down. Um, it has a non-stick quality to it, just like the parchment. Some people reuse them. Uh, I would say it's probably smart if these work for you to reuse them because of the cost of parchment versus PTFE. So just another kind of Pro tip, best practice, alternative to the parchment paper if you're seeing a lot of your terpenes leach into the... Uh, well, the and, and I know we throw away a lot of parchment, so the reusable aspect yeah. of this Love is... Love your uh, mother, you're right. Yep. Yep. If you want to reduce, reuse, this is, a great, this is a great tool for that as well. Great. Well, I appreciate you so much coming out here and helping with us. I know all of our viewers appreciate uh your wisdom again mary was in cascade is you know one of the original companies supporting the cannabis industry and you know i the first trade show i ever went to you guys were there so 
You're kind of the OGs of the industry. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's, it's, been, it's been a pleasure, and uh, it, it has not been boring. I've loved every minute of it. So and again, American-made. Yes, absolutely. Thank you again for supporting American-made products. And uh, if you have any questions, you can reach Kyler, uh, Lunatech, or Cascade. We're happy to make sure you get pointed in the right direction. And thank you, Joe. We'll take it to you. Awesome. Thanks again, guys. Um, so obviously, you know, a lot of information covered in uh, in regards to um, showing some finished products, going through and um, kind of fine tuning, uh, you know, what comes directly out of the IO extractor. So I wanted to make sure that, you know, I kind of gave a brief overview or rundown and got a little bit more specific on, um, you know, the IO extractor, the viscosity selector, and the ability to be able to use um, the recipe-driven uh, dashboard on uh, the I.O. Uh, to get to that final pour. Um, so, you know, when we're looking at, um, you know, selecting uh, for a, uh, a shatter product, you, you'd want to have kind of a, a really thick product where you're going to end up with, a, you know, a stable shatter or a pull and snap, obviously. Um, you know, loading or, or unloading of, you know, the biomass using the uh, biomass packer uh, or the stainless steel column that comes with the IO extractor. Uh, but on that final pour, you're obviously pouring out into parchment paper. Uh, you know, that final, uh, you know, vac oven time is about 24 hours with four flips. Um, the temperature right around 90, 95 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, basically you're ready to, um, you know, gram out for store shelves. And, you know, sugar, obviously jumping into a similar process, you want to select a viscosity of about five, you want it to write around a medium, all this depended on your input product, back oven time right around 36 to 46 hours, um, and uh, an oven temperature of approximately 105 degrees. And obviously sugar itself, I mean, depending on what you're going for as far as an end product, that can be whipped into a batter, butter, applesauce, you know, based on the post-processing whipping mix. Um, you know, generally, obviously, you know, you know, don't use, you know, electrical equipment due to the hazard, but there are, um, you know, there is equipment out there, obviously, that uh, um, can, can, can assist in that. Um, but also making a crumble, letting, um, you know, that product sit in a vacuum oven to muffin at about 105 degrees, pulling half vac, uh, you know, about 30 minutes in. And then basically releasing full vac, that muffin will stay intact and you've got to crumble. So obviously there's a litany of products getting to from a sugar consistency, uh, but sauce as well. I, I had this great infographic for you guys. I'd like us to send it to you, I will. And um, I think it really is just a really easy, uh, simplistic view of, um, you know, really just how easy it is to post-process with the IO um, and what comes out. So jumping back in, I mean, looking at getting to, uh, you know, diamonds, um, and sauce and being able to, you know, obviously want that product as thin as possible on a viscosity selector um, and letting it crash out for seven to 10 days uh, in order for those diamonds to develop in a, inside of a pressurized vessel. Um, and then, uh, you know, separation and then that final purge, obviously, um, to finishing that product um, after that time. So, Kyler covered a lot about this cured and uh, live resin vape carts. And uh, that process, again, is uh, extremely easy with a set of vacuum ovens and a hot plate. Again, you're looking for that product to crash out. Uh, two to three days, 10 days is ideal for the best crash out. Pour off the top sauce. Um, you know, in order to get to a cart, you don't even need to separate. Um, you can, you put in the vacuum oven again for 36 hours or so for a final purge at about 95 degrees. It's always good to kind of do a separate separation. Um, you can use something as simple as a metal coffee filter to strain um, and make sure you get a good separation. Um, either way, you're taking that, D, you know, that, that THCA, those, those diamonds that had formed from that product, um, and you want to turn it, you want to decarboxylate it um, and turn it into a stable product to be able to fill into a vape cart. So um, turning, turning that product into a distillate is as simple as 24 hours on a hot plate at 180, 200 degrees. So, um, you know, we really wanted to showcase the ability uh, and the capability, obviously, of the IO uh, with really keeping things simple, but also want to point out the fact that uh, using that vis viscosity selector and the preloaded recipes is nice, but how do you, how do you customize? How do you, um, how do you come up with new products? How do you, um, you know, save a recipe as? 
um, you know, when you're looking at um, uh, really fine tuning your consistency based on the input uh, biomass material. And, and the answer to that is it's pretty simple. The machine can be operated in full auto, um, you know, inside of the extraction booth itself. Uh, you actually have the ability to look inside of the column and right next to you is that start stop button. So while it's recovering that solvent, you can actually be keeping an eye um, and starting and stopping based off of your own preference um, to operate that machine fully manual. So uh, don't wanna take away from the freedom and flexibility. However, when you've got a stable product and you wanna create something consistently, um, you know, the IO really kind of has that answer to be able to do that um, and, and help, uh, help businesses scale and grow um, to a point where, um, you know, you've got some great margins. So um, obviously, um, you know, we've covered kind of a lot here today, but um, Kyler and Mary are getting set up here um, over in front of the camera. We, we brought a, a bead bath and, uh, and a diamond miner and Kyler brought some of Bobsled's finished products we'd like to showcase as well as a CRC column. Um, just before we go into the live kind of Q&A, where we'll give everyone here an opportunity to ask any specific questions and uh, get into the answers that might have gotten missed um, from some of the content uh, covered here today. So uh, I'm going to pass it over to Mary uh, to kick things off here in a second. And um, we should be ready to go. All right. Let me know when I'm You're good. I'm good. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for joining us on this part of the uh, live Q&A section. Thank you, Kyler. Um, so far, so good. Before we get into some of the Q&A, I wanted to just talk about a couple um, of my favorite toys and uh, some resources that will be of additional help. So um, it's pretty heavy, but the first thing I brought today is the Cascade Bead Bath. So I have a squeaky stool here up too. Um, a lot of you may be using a water bath in your lab uh, to keep uh, your distillate or extractions at a, at a proper viscosity. We talk a lot about viscosity with, uh, with extracts. So if you're using a water bath, a water bath has some, some not so great features. First of all, water, hot water, it's kind of a germ fest. And we really don't want that in a laboratory environment. Um, also a hot water bath will evaporate. And so you're wasting a lot of energy trying to keep up with the evaporation rate. So I've brought Cascades Bead Bath, which is the uh, more clean solution to a, to a water bath. So basically we have a bath here that um, has heaters in it, it will go up to about 80 Celsius. So plenty hot for, for keeping extracts in the proper viscosity. But the fun part, I don't know if you can see this, are these thermal beads, okay? These are a aluminum uh, bead with a patented coating on there that will keep items very stable in, in hot temperatures or even cold temperatures. So a lot of our customers will take their distillate or their extract, just sink it into this warm bead bath. Again, you don't have the germ fest of a water bath. Uh, you don't have the evaporation rates. It's just a nice, steady, freddy uh, temperature bath. Also, we have people that uh, sink their diamond miners into the, the warmth of a bead bath. If you don't have an oven that is available, you can also, it's kind of fun to, to cover up the window to get the, uh, the necessary darkness to help with the uh, with creating the diamonds. So just a, a great bench top tool is called the bead bath. Now, if you already have a water bath and you want to ditch the water, Lunatech can also hook you up with just the beads. Okay, these are just great multi-purpose. You can dump these into your existing water bath and they will, will keep and maintain hot temperatures just the same. You don't have to buy the box. Also, they keep cold temperatures cold as well. So just a great all-purpose lab tool to have that I wanted to bring in uh, today to show you. Um, also, because you took the time to listen to our post-processing webinar, uh, Lunatech is offering a special deal on Cascade's post-processing equipment through the month of, month of June. So 
Any Cascade post-processing equipment that uh, Luna quotes to you in the month of June, you get an additional 10% off. That is fantastic. Every little bit helps. So do take advantage of that for the month of June. And we, of course, appreciate your support of all of our American-made products. One last thing I want to tell you about, because we did have a thing with the infographic, is Cascade also has a couple really handy infographics on the whole post-processing flow. Uh, if you're interested in having Lunatech send one of those to you, certainly reach out and we will get them right over into your email box. Okay. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mary. And I just want to point out because I've been in a lab a lot of times and I've seen the water bath and they develop a gross film on top, which, yeah. you know, you complete, you don't want to be sticking and pulling out jars and getting that weird film all over your expensive products. So this bath and these beads make a lot of sense. Um, yeah, well, and so thank what do, you. Yeah, what do you have here? Let's see. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mary. I have a couple items I'm going to show you guys, but what I really wanted to do is just stress the purpose of this webinar, which, which is to show the ease that uh, is associated with hydrocarbon BHO extracting compared to you know, CO2 or ethanol, because there's on those processes, there's so many post-processing steps needed to get to a finished product compared to BHO that becomes a finished product out of the machine only needed with a uh, paired with a vacuum oven to purge that final remainder out right. of the solvent, which you can get, um, you know, a lot of people say, oh, BHO, you know, you're leaving a solvent in your product and it's harmful to consumers. But with the proper purge and using the right equipment, the right vacuum oven, you can get that product down to zero parts per million uh, residual solvent. So it is a extremely safe and uh, very enjoyable consumable product. And it comes finished out of the machine, which compared to CO2 or ethanol um, products, you have to winterize it. So even if you're using a CO2 product, uh, you're still in that uh, the process of refining it to be ready for a customer. You're adding ethanol to winterize it, um, and you know. So now you have to purge that solvent out of your CO2 product. And I think if you if you just go to any dispensary, you look at the product mix of how many products there are actually made with BHO extraction versus, say, ethanol or CO2. And I think you will find that the lion's share of the products in dispensaries, which is what consumers are after, are made with BHO extraction. Yeah, that is an excellent point, Mary. And uh, yeah, and again, just the the simplicity to get to that finished product compared to the other types of forms of extraction that has all the post extra post processing involved. Um, I did want to quickly point out, um, we have a couple products here and I want to talk about filtering inline filtering of the BHO product. So if you do have, you know, depending on the quality of your biomass, um, a little bit older products might come out a little bit darker. Um, with the product CRX and CRY, which Luna sells both those products, uh, you could actually clean up and inline get, um, you know, from gold, yellow to even a clear, um, high quality product out of that machine. Of course, you'll be wanting to use a filter plate if you're using those products to ensure none of the filter products gets fire in the product, which Lunatech also sells and has on its website. Um, and again, yeah, I brought, if you want to bring the camera a little closer, I will show you some of these finished products that we have. Oh, wow. So I brought a few products for you guys to see. I'll start with the diamonds because those seem to be what people are interested in these days, but you'll see the actual big fauceted formations. Um, and this comes with uh, pouring out uh, your cannabinoid solvent ratio out of the extractor 
putting it in a jar or the diamond miners that Cascade provides to get that pressurized vessel, which will allow over time the THCA to actually crash out of the solution and form these diamond formations, which again, diamonds is just the cannabis industry term for isolate. This is going to have a 99.9% uh, THC um, potency. So a very pure product. Um, here you could kind of see we have some different consistencies of sugar. Um, here is a, you know, naturally ran non-filtered product versus a filtered product. So you can see in line, you know, the color difference that you can achieve. And again, this isn't post-processing. This isn't uh, filtering after the product. This is all in line, which is efficient and time-saving. And then uh, we have some shatter here too. I put in a jar for you guys, but you can see it's more of that stable consistency and uh, you'd pour out onto a parchment. But all of these uh, different consistencies can be made at the push of a button on the IO extractor. Um, yeah, and I think uh, we're ready for questions. I uh, apologize for the technical difficulties. Adam can hear us officially, and I think we can hear, hear him. Adam, you there with us? Yeah, can you guys hear me now? Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Um, yeah. So we, let's go ahead and get some Q and A going here. Um, the first thing that's pretty important for everyone to understand is when we're talking about the cascade oven temperature, are we speaking about it in Fahrenheit or Celsius? Um, that it could be controlled, you know, either way. But when I've talked about the temperatures, I've always referred to as Fahrenheit. Okay. Yeah, and just as a as an aside, the um, the place I come from, aerospace and pharma, they are all uh, Celsius people, and so um, cannabis often works in Fahrenheit, which is fine. So the controller on the oven is selectable to Fahrenheit or Celsius, pretty easy. Uh, but for all practical purposes, our default is Fahrenheit. Awesome. Um, so the next question is. Um, how long does it usually take to go from uh, to for all the residual solvents to basically be purged out of the oil, let's say for a shatter product? Yeah, so I was just you said shatter, but I was just going to say um, the thickness really mm -hmm. makes comes into play there. And even on shatter, you know, you can pour a 50 gram slab or you could pour a 300 gram slab. Um, so the thickness does come into play, but I would say, you know, with two days and four flips, you know, you're pretty much guaranteed to be at that zero residual um, parts. But it, again, temperature comes into play too. So that's at, you know, 105 degrees, uh, 48 hours uh, with four flips would be a safe bet. But again, um, yeah, so you can you can get have it tested at the lab and you really want to test your SOPs. So that's a good starting base, but I would, you know, get your uh, lab involved and results back to, as well. I want to touch on something about this, about the uh, the time to purge uh, solvent. So, Carla, you're right. The variables that you can control is you can control the temperature. Um, you can control the thickness of the slab and whether or not you choose to flip. But one thing I want to talk about is we have customers that actually, when they're doing a purge, they'll actually close the vacuum valve, okay, and just have the slab sit in this, this vacuum atmosphere for a certain amount of time. And my, my concern about that practice is that you've, you've closed the door, essentially, so the residual solvents that we're trying to get rid of the things you're trying to pull out of your slab and get them, you know, get you to zero ppm, we shut the door. So what happens is when they those residual molecules do outgas, they kind of bounce around and hang hang around and they they don't leave. So if the goal is to get to zero ppm or reduce or eliminate the residual solvents, keep the vacuum valve open during your purge. 
Well, thank you for uh, that information because I know some people do uh, close it off. And so I leave it open to the vacuum uh, the full time as well. And uh, again, in that line, I have a cold trap, which mm -hmm. I think is very important. Uh, not only does it protect your pump, but you get a monetary value out of it in return by collecting those terpenes. And those terpenes are actually, in fact, worth more than the THC. Great. Um, very thorough answer. Thank you both for that. Um, so the next question that we have is in regards to the sugar, at what point do you cover the sugar with the saran wrap? At what point in the process? So that is an excellent collect question. It's uh, covered any time it is left out into the atmosphere um, to open. So if I'm doing a pour from the extractor and I pour the product and say I'm doing multiple runs into the same Pyrex. Every time I'm you know, done pouring product into it, I would cover it with Saran Wrap. Um, but then when I'm, whether it's going into the oven or back underneath the extraction nozzle to be added more, the Saran Wrap comes off. Uh, you would not want to purge uh, the oil in the oven with the Saran Wrap on because you'd be, it would suck the saran wrap right into the oil. So um, you want to just make sure that the Pyrex is covered and it's purely to prevent uh, con contaminants from getting in. And another, uh, another mention about contaminants is when you have something in the vacuum oven, any time that you are venting, so you're cracking that vent valve or you're opening the door, you are actually letting in your ambient outside air into the oven. So you don't have to worry about this too much, but I have seen some facilities where maybe the, the purging of the and oven is, is outdoors or it's humid or something like that. I'm assuming we actually do this at ours. We hook up nitrogen to the vent valve so that when we are, uh, it is, re-adding sure. atmosphere to the uh, oven instead of just the lab atmosphere, which could have dust, right. you know, any and sorts of particulates in it. The vent valve is in the back of the oven. And some people, if you have your oven crammed up against the corner of a lab, are you really paying attention to the air source? Back yeah. There? And if you look back yeah. there, it's probably dusty. Oh, yeah, 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 um, yeah. But yeah, hooking it up to, you know, nitrogen is a excellent way to keep a clean product. And that nitrogen is clean clean gas that could be added back. A word about nitrogen. Nitrogen purging is a best practice use in vacuum aerospace applications all the time because they are fanatical about anti-contamination. So cannabis adopting a nitrogen purge is, is definitely a best practice right in line. Is it a must? No, but it is definitely, definitely a best practice. Nitrogen makes up most of the air that we're breathing right now, okay? But nitrogen does displace oxygen, and oxygen is an oxidizer. That's why people want to backfill with nitrogen or vent with nitrogen, because we, we want to reduce the risk of, of oxidation or, or water, and things mm -hmm. like that. A note about nitrogen, though, is that nitrogen, since it does displace oxygen, you need to work with nitrogen safely in a well-ventilated space. If you flood a very tiny room that is poorly ventilated with nitrogen, you will displace the oxygen, you will go nighty-night, and you will be in big trouble because you won't have enough oxygen in the mix. So just be mindful about that. Nitrogen purge, excellent best practice for vacuum purging, but also safety considerations of ventilation around the oven so that we're not not displacing all the oxygen in the room and having a really bad day well that is a very good point <laughs> yep definitely on a personal note uh, have the same uh, concept with dry ice as well so don't don't uh sit don't spend too much time in a closed area with a bunch of dry ice because it'll do the same thing um so learn that one the hard way. <laughs> okay. All right. So the next question we have is what do you do with the mother sauce from diamonds? So that's an excellent question. And there is a lot of different uh, 
uses for the sauce, you know, they call it sauce, HTE, which is high terpene extract um, or mother liquor. Um, that is just the, by crashing out the THCA, you're now left with, you know, it still has THCA in it, but a really high terpene content. Um, you can load that straight into cartridges. You could add it to, um, say, like a dispenser or a, a distillate line that wants to have cannabis drive terpenes. Um, you could sell it just as, you know, an adaptable form as sauce. Um, there are tons of different methods for it. We mostly use it to uh, go for our cartridges just because it's the highest return um, for the value is the. So it's, very pro it's a very profitable. Yeah, yeah, any product with the high terpene content okay. is going to be, you know, a desired, desi well desired product. Or, you know, you could do diamonds and sauce, mix it back in and that's a hot product as well on the dispensary shelf. Awesome. Uh, we have another question here. It's just uh, going back to the decarbing um, process for the live resin cartridges. Um, they were just wondering if you could kind of tap on that again, how you recommend decarbing the, the sugar to prepare for that. Yeah. So I would just, um, whether it's in a vacuum oven or on a hot plate, um, I wouldn't use a conventional oven because you want to have that controlled temperature. Um, but the lowest heat possible um, is best to not uh, degrade the terpenes. So if you stick to like the 180 or, you know, 200 and below, and that's Fahrenheit, um, in a pressurized vessel so that the terpenes then you don't want them evaporating. Uh, either. Um, you can actually slowly decarb that product and convert that THC to Delta 9, um, which is going to make it work well into a cart. It will never crystallize again like THCA does. That's the whole point. Um, we're not turning this product into distillate per se, but what we are doing is converting the THCA to Delta 9 like distillate, which is what enables distillate and then now enables the BHO to keep a liquid consistency and an oil consistency that works well in a vape cart. So it's not, you know, a big secret is, or it's an advanced method. Um, it's really THCA wants to crash out and sugar and form diamonds and Delta nine wants to be, you know, a oil liquid consistency. So it works great in a cart and so it's, 200 it's a, degrees for 24 hours uh, will be a nice timeline. So if you see that, that, that sugaring up, it hasn't, it has not been properly decarboxylated. Yeah. Say? It has not been decarboxylated at, yeah. If it's, if you've heated it and it does sugar again, it just needs to be okay. more heat, but um you know, that sugaring up is, you know, shows that it's THCA and it's a valuable product in the dispensary shelves as well. So, Adam, we got time for uh, one more, you know, maybe a couple more questions here and then we're at about uh, an hour and five. So we should let these folks go after that. So two more questions and we'll wrap things up here today. OK, um, so how are you partially decarbing the cured resin cart and still able to retain the terpenes? Um, that is that temperature and uh, stick by staying under 200 and putting it either in a mason jar or, you know, some sort of sealed vessel so that the terpenes don't evaporate. Um, just as long as you stay under that 200 degree Fahrenheit mark, uh, you're going to enable to decarb without degrading the terpenes. I mean, you can open up a jar and smell it and it's going to smell, you know, identical to before it was heated and, you know, retain its uh, full terpene profile. So I, if you have not done it, I highly recommend you do it um, because I believe uh, BHO cartridges will displace distillate cartridges on the shelf. And that is because of cannabis derived terpenes. That is what an educated consumer wants. 
Um, really, like the customers don't want blueberry. They won't, don't want strawberry. They want sour diesel. They want blue dream. Um, they want OG. And uh, they want the cartridge to taste like the weed smells that they love, the flower. And BHO cartridges are the only way to get there. And if you are actually interested in measuring the, the batch decarb temperature while it's inside the vacuum oven, or what, um, we have some tools that will help you do that so that you, you make sure that, you know, if maybe if it's in a mason jar or something like that, you know when that product has actually stabilized at the decarb temperature. You can measure the duration. It's a great, great tool to make sure that we, we get it right the first time. So Definitely. it can help with that as well. Great. So for the final question here, um, we just have, a, it, it's related to the decarb again for the live resin cartridges. They were wondering if you could just specify on that uh, equipment that you had that it's just pressure vessels. It's not a vacuum vessel set up there. It's, it's Cor just a correct. And really it's just, it's a pressure vessel, but I mean, I would consider it's really just a sealed vessel um, that is not enabling the terpenes to evaporate off because terpenes are highly volatile. Um, so you want to make sure you heat it in a sealed vessel so that those terpenes don't escape and those terpenes can be mixed, you know, retained in that product. That is why you want it in a sealed vessel, whether it's in a sealed vessel that's jacketed and you can control the heat and decarboxylation process that way, or in a mason jar like container, that you put into, you know, a cascade oven or a bead bath. The bead bath would work yeah, as well. Bead bath would work too. Great. Well, uh, I, that was the last question that we have set up here. And if anyone else has any further questions, they can always reach out to um, us over here at Lunatech directly, uh, sales or info at lunatech.com. Um, and we can get you hooked up with any of our products or any of the products in the Cascade Sciences lineup. And also uh, remember what Mary said with the offer through June um, that we'll be giving a 10% off all of the Cascade products in our lineup for that month. Awesome. Um, again, Mary, thank you so much for joining us here today. We really appreciate you coming out. And uh, obviously, Kyle, we love having you. Um, and, uh, and Adam as well. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Um, and, uh, and it's been a pleasure to give you another look uh, you know, inside here um and you know we hope you found all the information here both informative and worthwhile i uh, apologize for some of the audio hiccups and uh and confusion but again the information here today can be found uh for many of us and uh, a replay will be sent out and made available to anyone who registered here today so until next time from all of us here at luna technologies bob's Lead extracts and cascade sciences thank you all for joining us have a good one bye-bye